Would you like your garden to be more sustainable? I've been going around my garden to find some of the easiest and money-saving ways to be more eco-friendly. And it is important to find eco-friendly tips that are, save you time or money or are easy to do because then you're much more likely to do them more often and it's only by changing habits that we can really have a sustainable garden. And collectively we urban gardeners actually run quite a lot of the open space available in towns and cities. So let's start with sustainable plastic pots. Most plants are sold in black plastic pots which can't go through the recycling because the sorters can't pick up the black tint in the pots. A number of nurseries are now selling plants in recyclable pots, so look out for those. And if you have been buying plants in black plastic pots, then reuse them for your own planting. There's no need, I don't think, to make pots out of newspaper or to buy more pots because there are just so many plant pots in, tucked away in our potting sheds anyway. If you don't have lots of black plastic pots, maybe a gardening friend does. I'm sure I'd be absolutely thrilled to give any of my pots away. And perhaps you can have a pot exchange evening or something like that. What about other single-use plastics in the garden, like, for example, the bags that compost is sold in? A nursery near me, Edible Culture, is now selling their compost in reusable bags for life. So you pay slightly more for the bag and the compost when you first buy it, but then you take the bag back and you get a refill and that costs slightly less. And that's a really good idea. So you could look out for nurseries doing that or suggest it. And you can also order compost in bulk. But of course, making your own compost is the most environmentally friendly thing you can do because you're returning the nutrients to the soil. The thing to know about making compost is that there are two ways of making compost. There's the fast hot method which involves knowing a bit about the percentages of what kind of material goes into your compost heap and then there's the slower easy method which I do where you really just throw pretty much any green matter and vegetable peelings and any raw fruit and veg into your compost bin. Now this does take a lot longer to compost down so you will find that you do also have to buy compost but it is incredibly easy and it's still a very useful amount of compost. There's a post more about this in the description below. So if you have to buy compost the important thing is to look for peat free. The RHS says that no gardener should be buying a peat based compost because the damage this does to the environment is huge. I've been given some Westland New Horizon Bio 3 peat-free compost to trial and I've been trying it against a standard peat-based compost which I happen to have around and I think it's very good. I've actually had better seed germination from that than from the standard compost. What about bonfires? Well bonfires aren't as good for the environment because of the smoke. However, bonfire ash is actually very good for the garden. So when you do a bonfire, scatter the ash on the beds and that will help add nutrients back into the soil. Saving water in the garden. Well, water is a very big issue in many places around the world. And in the garden, water is responsible for about 30% of your domestic consumption. The best thing you can do is not to water your lawn because the lawn will go brown in a drought, but it'll recover. Get water butts, but get the biggest you can because a small water butt will dry out very quickly in a drought. And if you can reuse household water, such as water from the condenser drying machine, then that's great as well. There's more about this in the description below and links to videos on this. What about sustainable garden furniture? Well, the most sustainable thing is to reuse and recycle. Going around the garden, I can see that the sewing machine table that my mother gave me in the 1980s is wonderfully eco environmentally friendly. And we bought four metal chairs from a depot vent in France. You can get second-hand furniture in junk shops and many charity shops now have furniture departments, so put charity furniture shop near me into Google. And you can also try eBay, Freecycle and Freegal. And don't just think about garden furniture. A friend of mine has bought a wonderful glass and metal office table for her garden. And of course, anything that will be fine outside can work as garden furniture. If you're buying new garden furniture, look for eco-friendly credentials such as for wood, FSC certification. That means Forestry Stewardship Council. And they police things like illegal logging, deforestation, and the conditions that people work in in the timber industry. 
What about plant labels? For years I've been using plastic plant labels and they get scattered all around the garden in the beds and in the compost heaps and they're really irritating. This year I've bought some Nutley's wooden plant labels and they're a little bit cheaper and they're just as easy to use and they will biodegrade. And I could also have bought even more cheaply wooden lollipop sticks and there's a link to that in the description below. And plant ties as well are sometimes made of plastic. I've been using wool and jute plant ties for quite some time because I was sent them for review and actually they're very good. But a professional gardening friend of mine once told me that you can support trees and larger shrubs with pieces of tights cut up, tights or stockings cut up. And of course, these are fantastically flexible materials. They won't harm the wood and you're reusing something you've already got. What about sustainable garden supports? Well, I find that the plastic and the plastic covered garden supports really aren't strong enough anyway. I've got some U-shaped metal garden supports, which I can just jam in anywhere that a plant is flopping over and also some of the bigger peony supports and so on but I also make my own gut plant supports out of birch twigs and actually that is quite easy and I'm not a particularly handy person and there's a blog and a video about that in the description below. So what about sustainable garden paving? Well, stone and brick and gravel and shingle are all mined or used natural materials in some way, but obviously stone and brick are very long lasting. You can find recycled garden materials but one of the most important things about sustainable paving is to make sure you're not contributing to runoff. If you have a driveway or a patio or a path or a terrace, it's important to make sure that the water can soak in around the pavers, that it's not one solid sheet of concrete or stone with cement based pointing in it. Because if you have heavy rain and water goes rushing over a driveway or over a terrace, that's what contributes to flash flooding in towns and cities. We have a seashell path. It's cockle shell mulch and it's a byproduct from the seafood industry and we laid it on top of an existing gravel path and there's more about that in a link in the description below but that's very environmentally friendly because it's not mining anything. One of the top things you can do to have a sustainable garden is to plant a tree or not to cut a tree down. Trees are fantastic carbon sinks in towns and cities and they also support wildlife in many ways. Because of the building that's going on in the mo at the moment, a lot of trees are being lost. Collectively, it's just one or two on each site, but it does add up to quite a lot in every town and city, and that has an impact for our air quality. And then there's using environmentally friendly pest controls. I use slug pellets made of ferric phosphate, which are certified for organic use, but there are a lot of people who feel that any slug pellets are really not helpful to wildlife. And they use things like slug, anti-slug wool mulches or copper. I personally have not found copper very successful, but it's worth a try. That using plastic netting to keep birds off your crops is one thing, and uh, but you can reuse it, so it's not a single-use plastic. But also, I have several friends who keep the birds off their crops by jamming birch twigs in around. It seems to discourage the pigeons from walking in amongst the kale and the lettuces. I'm actually trying this out this year with plastic netting covering some kale and some spinach in one bed and just birch twigs covering the same kale and spinach in another to see actually how well this works. And I don't really understand how it works, but it does seem to work. So maybe it's worth a try. Then there are planting pollinator friendly plants. We hear a lot about wildlife meadows and of course they are wonderful for wildlife, but you don't have to have wildlife planting to have pollinator friendly garden. The most important thing is to have flowers in your garden from as early in the year to as late in the year so there is something for pollinators to feed on. And a lot of companies these days will put on the plant label whether it's pollinator friendly or bee friendly and a lot of companies selling seeds will allow you to search via pollinator friendly categories or bee friendly categories so it is really quite helpful. Essentially however the double the more elaborate double flowers are more difficult for pollinators to get nectar out of. So you're thinking about single flowers that are, you can obviously see the centre of them. Sustainable garden boundaries. Hedges are much more environmentally friendly than fences because they offer habitat for wildlife and because they also help improve air quality, like all green planting. 
If you're buying a fence, look for FSC certification. And also, if you have a gravel board at the base, which is a sort of solid plank made of cement, make sure there's a few holes in it because wildlife need to roam from garden to garden, especially hedgehogs. And what about bat boxes and bug hotels? They've become something of a fashion accessory in the last few years. So it is important to make sure that you actually get them right. And I'd advise consulting the various wildlife trusts, and there are links in the description below, to make sure that you actually use the right materials and you position them in the right places. But a very simple way of supporting bugs is simply to have a little corner of the garden where you throw twigs and bits of logs and a few bits of broken pottery just tucked out of the way and they will be very grateful for that. There are links to everything I've mentioned in the description below and also to a blog post on the Middle Size Garden blog which has a sustainable garden checklist showing how you can make your garden more environmentally friendly easily and it'll save you money. And do press like if you've enjoyed this because then I know you'd like to see more eco-friendly and environmentally friendly videos on the Middle Size Garden blog and if you haven't subscribed we come out on Saturdays with tips, ideas and inspiration for people whose gardens are middle-sized.